spent around 30 years in the music industry, mostly on the inside of record companies, and uh, the rest acting for artists and smaller labels. And what I want to start at the beginning by saying the one big thing I've learnt is this, and that's despite all the, all the bile and things that are said about labels and their evil ways, in the real world it's simply not black hats versus white hats. Um, there are some, of course, both artists and execs, and they can make the business very, very interesting. But 80% of the time, the business is more subtle and complex, and it's just shades of grey. And I've seen some awful things done to artists by execs and record companies, but I can assure you I've seen artists encouraged and abetted by their managers and lawyers do equally appalling things time after time and year after year. So it's not as simple as one group of good guys and one group of bad guys. The music business is capitalism at its best and its worst. And you're melding art and commerce, and that makes some very interesting dynamics. So hopefully I can give you a bit of a, an insight that will help you through that minefield. So if you're going to enter a relationship with a music label, it helps to have what I think is a realistic understanding of what really drives that relationship. Um, I'm looking aside from the creativity, because this is all about deals, remember? And also um, what underpins that relationship. So I'm going to start with a, a wonderful few lines from the book Kill Your Friends. It's about how hard it is to get signed. It's set in a, the UK a decade ago, but it's equally as valid today. And if you haven't read the book, I highly recommend it. So bear with me. Uh, so this guy, he's, a, he's an A&R guy in a record label, fictional record label in the UK. He says, we receive upwards of 300 unsolicited demo tapes every week. There are five other labels within our corporate group, all receiving about the same volume. That's 1,500 demos a week. There are six other corporate groups, EMI, Universal, Warners, Polygram, BMG and Sony most with several, like, several labels within them, all receiving at least the same amount of us and probably a little more. That's over 10,000 little packages of hopes and dreams arriving every week. To this 10,000 we should add conservatively another couple of thousand to cover the demos received by all the independent labels. That makes roughly 12,000 demos a week received by the whole industry, well over half a million a year. In any given year, my company will sign maybe like 10 to 15 acts. The whole UK industry probably signs at most a couple of hundred artists every year. Out of these 200, in a very good year, you might have 20 or so <coughs> excuse me, who, break, who break through to some degree, who get their records on the radio, their pitches in the music press, and who fill decent-sized venues. Out of this 20, maybe half will eventually recoup the money invested in them. That's right, 10 acts out of uh, over half a million hopefuls will make themselves some real money. And yet a lot of aspiring musicians really believe that getting signed means they've made it, and the physical act of signing a recording contract means they're on the way to fame, riches, and drinking Bono's Cristal at the Grammys. So. Um, contrast that with a, a comment from someone I found on the web at Music Business Solutions um, who says, an artist who signs to a major label recording contract today is probably taking the biggest risk of his career. With a mortality rate of 9 out of 10 failures, it's clearly a crapshoot whether or not a major artist will make it or not. Now I'm sure you're all thinking like, well, yep, this is a real horror show. Uh, why would anyone ever sign up? But my view is, is that really the right way to look at it? Because the last comment tells me that this guy really doesn't understand the business at all, and here's why. I've got some older statistics here, but they're still pretty valid. In 2010, there were 75,000 albums released in the US. 60,000 sold less than 100. Only 2,000 sold more than 5,000. Only 1,000 sold over 10,000 units. And if you look at the charts, the majority of those 1,000 albums that sold over 2,000 were released by record labels, majors and independents. So if we look at this week's ARIA Top 40, album chart from a very quick scan, 98% or 38 out of the 40 were on or through majors, many being indies through majors, so through record labels. So objectively, when you look at the odds, apart from the horrendous odds of actually just getting, list, getting listened to, then the odds of getting signed through the odds of just charting and then on to actually becoming a success, maybe, just maybe, for all the ills, an indie or a major label isn't the worst place in the world to actually shorten those odds. The fact is it's always been tough. And so much of it depends on what you really want, and what you want to achieve, and how much you want it. So to work that out, you really need to have an idea as to why you want to tie yourself to a company. What's a record company really going to do for you, especially when that success rate is so low? Well, a record company, big or small, is essentially a marketing entity. It has to make money from selling recordings, and that doesn't mean the founders and the staff don't have real passion for music, because they really do. Every company I've worked with, been involved in is packed with a lot of smart people who love music and people who constantly do their best to break and market their artists. But if they lose money, they cease to exist, and most people don't like the idea of that. The good news is that it is labels who invest the most in creating new music. 
and breaking new music, it's in their interest, their commercial interest, to invest in creating new music and marketing that music. And marketing is as big or bigger cost than making the recordings. And every new release, if you think about it, starts from scratch in marketing. So investing in music is very high risk. You won't find banks doing it. The numbers just don't add up. The music business has always been ruled by unpredictability and luck. And music companies have to spread their bets around. The few winners have to pay for all the losers. It's something individually people don't focus on, but the labels do, and they have to. They have to do it every day. And no one has yet found a way around that high-risk reality, despite all the stuff that digital companies come up with and all the rest of it. That you need to look at a new model. They haven't come up with a particularly new model that underpins that investment and that risk. And music companies really do value content in its creators. They have to nurture the talent. Their business is built solely on those who create music. But their deals, that's what this session's about, their deals are based on managing risk, and that's pu pure and simple. And time doesn't permit me to go into all the impact of digital, but effectively the business is half the size it was, which obviously lessens the investment capability phenomenally around the world. It's about 50% of what it was. Um, but that doesn't mean there aren't lots of opportunities, which we'll get to. So assuming you've decided you want a deal, how the hell do you actually get one? Well, there are any number of experts and views on how. Ideally, you build a strategy that ends up with the label seeking you. And even better, you have more than one label trying to sign you. The, the holy grail for most artists and managers is enjoying the leverage of playing several majors off against one another in a bidding war. It still happens, happens regularly, because real talent is scarce, the market is tougher than ever, and nothing motivates a &R people like the fear of going down in history as being the one who missed the next Beatles. So in short, you really need to build your reputation through sheer hard work, I think Cathy was talking about that before, and combine that with savvy techniques to get, to get noticed. And if a band has what it takes, A&R will come. Social media has dram drastically changed the A&R landscape. People talk, labels hear and show up to gigs or on Facebook or YouTube. It does YouTube, it does happen. And being savvy means cultivating industry relationships, targeting the surprisingly few real decision makers. Decision makers have very limited time and finite funds to invest. So you need to grab the attention of the people they trust. Publishers and managers can be critical in getting exposure and direction, the exposure, direction providing expertise and getting you signed to the right label. Don't underestimate them and seek out the best. And even with genuine talent, you need to shorten the odds in your favour. No one else is going to do it for you. Playing the blame or victim game isn't going to help. No one is sitting around thinking they owe you something. You've got to make it happen yourself. So you've decided to pursue a deal. What are you going to go for? What are you going to do? Well, I'm just going to run through a very quick overview of the range of deals that are out there at the moment. Um, uh, basically, there's any number of books and online, all the types of deals you can go in the details. I'm just going to do some touch points to give you some talking points after that about the, what I've learned from a few deals. Um, most of these deal points apply to indies and majors. There's nothing really magic about most of them. Um, the first sort of species, I suppose, is uh, demo and development deals. Effectively, they, uh, where the, the label just pays a few thousand dollars to develop up some uh, recordings from an artist who's just an aspiring level. Um, it, it, it locks them in, locks the artist in a little bit, hopefully stops the competition getting in too early and really is just seeing if the artist has some magic there that you couldn't quite pick first. That's a very low level and uh, really not that binding. The other type of deal or another type of deal is sort of a licence deal. Effectively that's when the, uh, the artist more often than not controls or owns the copyright in the, in the, in the, in the masters uh, and they'll licence it to the record company for a limited term and probably a limited territory. They might give it to five years for Australia, New Zealand only and license different companies in different territories around the world. But they usually expect the, the main label to provide all the full suite of marketing services. Next level is what everybody knows about is the exclusive recording contract, which again the artist commits to the record company for a number of albums with the options on most of the albums. The label funds all the costs, owns all the recordings. And, um, and that, that rolls on to another area, which is the 360 deal, which a lot of you have probably heard, which is where it's basically the same as a recording contract, only the record label expects to get a slice of all the artist's entire entertainment earnings, including touring and merchandising and all the other, all the other areas, mainly to try and sort of recoup some of the costs that uh, also the loss over the last few years. As I said, industry's 50% down. Everybody's looking to try and make more money to keep investing and keep making a profit. There are things called production deals, which you don't see a lot of, I don't think, anymore, where effectively that's a, a one-man band, like a producer or someone, will sign a few artists to themselves and then license those to the record company. Um, it's not a, that one person is not a record label itself. 
Uh, another type of deal are label deals, where effectively that is a, that probably there's overheads paid by the major label. There'll be a, a smaller indie label, and then that, that label will license all of its artists to the, the major label. That's a bigger version of a production deal. There's also joint ventures, where which are becoming more popular, especially for indies, where every single cost of manufacturing, recording, marketing, and overhead is deducted from all the sales, and then the balance is split 50-50. Um, and then there's a lot of distribution type deals, uh, which is bare distribution, which is basically getting the records in stores or basically just getting the, um, the digital up, up online. Uh, that's really for artists who've got, have funded their own recordings and are really comfortable with the funding their own marketing and undertaking their own marketing. Effectively, artists would usually get like, say, 80%, but they pay all their own costs. There's a whole lot of different varieties of self distribution. It ranges from I've seen a, a country artist in uh, North Queensland, sells between Ten to 20,000 albums a year at $20 a pop, postage and handling on, on top. So he grosses like 100 to 200 grand every release. Um, he does his own marketing, the family come round, they get into the garage with all the CDs there, and it's a really effective little business model. Um, doesn't need to go through any label whatsoever. That doesn't, not everybody's able to do that. Of course, there's lots and lots of artists are putting up the releases digital only. That's great to get it out there, but of course, how are you going to cut through that clutter of everybody else doing it and get noticed unless you're prepared to market yourself, which is much harder to do than a lot of people realise. Then you've got other more established artists. I think the um, uh, John Butler Trio run it this way. They pretty much have a, a team of people, four, six people as a mini label themselves just for their own, their own releases and they take the role of a record company, but they still perform the same tasks except they control it all themselves to their own staff. And then there's a, another area of distribution which has become more popular in the last uh, five years or so, where the major labels will have a, um, uh, like a, a menu of distribution services. So the artists will do a distribution deal, then they'll say, if, if we pay you another 5%, will you take this to radio for, you know, we'll pay you 5% for two months of sales and we'll take it to radio and another 3% for this and that. And it's a menu and you pick and choose what services you want. Um, and then there are various indie deals where people, uh, labels will just sign a range of, a whole range of just singles only um, and just hope for one of them will pop and that one single will sort of bring the riches. So some observations about deals, there's no sort of specific rhyme or reason to the things that popped into my mind. Um, a brand, branding, I think a few people before have talked about how important branding is becoming and sponsorships and endorsements, that's becoming critical. 20 years ago, um, even 10 years ago, most artists were like, don't even talk to me about this, it's going to uh, destroy my creativity, it's horrendous. 180 degrees in the current market, everybody needs to make a dime if they want to keep uh, creating their music. Uh, basically, most artists are saying, what are you going to do for us? How are you going to achieve this? What are you going to... Uh, what sponsorship opportunity are you going to bring in to me? So the world's turned on its head in that area. And uh, most companies, most major companies, have a lot of staff being put on that area. And there's people who have been, been fired from other divisions that they've downsized. They've actually increased this area enormously. Um, on self-distribution, I've sort of flagged that, that area about the various angles there. A lot, it's, digital is not the panacea for self-distribution. Um, and a lot of the P&D deals simply just don't make the money that P&D is the distribution. A lot of artists think they're going to make a lot of money when they go to the distribution because the, the bulk of the 80% of the, the money goes in their pocket. But more often than not, it's quite a shock when they realise how hard it is to be a record label. By the time they pay their manufacturing and their marketing and the other costs, they're like, oh, is that all I get? It's like, well, welcome to the real world. Not good, but that's the way it goes. Um, one thing I've learned over the years is don't just do a deal for the, for the money. Um, obviously, take the best deal out there, but if you've got a range of options, don't just go with the one that has the big numbers on it because that may well be the right one, but you've got to go with the right people, the right feel, everything is great for the way that your music is going to be treated and the people you're going to work with daily. And just taking the big numbers is not necessarily going to be the solution. And other areas to think about is like you can be too smart by half on deals, or I call it be careful what you wish for. I remember years and years ago, uh, a superstar artist got the first ever joint venture deal with the major label I was at, and it was quite a revolutionary thing at the time. The profits were going to be split 50-50. I remember I was overseas and I was talking to people about it and saying, wow, this, this deal is amazing. And they were like, oh, yeah, we're not going to worry about that that much anymore. He can do his own stuff. We're going to focus on all these artists because we're putting all the same amount of work in to get half the amount of revenue now. We might as well focus on these developing artists. It sounds cool, but that's just the motive, and you've got to keep those things in the back of your mind, what drives people. And there's a lot of... Uh, Publicity, I don't know if any of you have seen it, about 50-50 splits on streaming. There's been cases against m and &M and on and on, all that sort of stuff. But 50-50 splits for a record label effectively don't work given the cost structures that are involved. And 
I don't know if Martin Mills, who uh, runs Beaker's Banquet. Last week he was quoted in Billboard, and he's one of the icons of the indie world. So for him to say this really uh, underpins the, the, the importance of it. And Billboard said, what's the principal reason behind reducing streaming royalties? And his answer, economical, period. And he goes on to say, a record company needing to provide the services we do cannot survive paying artists 50% of net income. As streaming becomes core income, it has to bear its share of all our costs, A&R, overhead, marketing, promotion, back office services, etc. So I thought that was interesting coming from someone who's an icon of the indie world. And never underestimate the capacity to be able to renegotiate a deal once you've signed. Yes, they are incredibly tough um, in, the, in the first place, but once you get leverage, that big word leverage, once you become successful, the tide starts to turn, people aren't shy about coming in the door, they know that you started at a low level and everybody has to be kept happy. So renegotiation is a real option. It has to be based on real success, by the way. There's numerous artists who've got 500,000 in costs and sold 10,000 units, and they're like, we've got to renegotiate. And everybody's like, eh, it's a bit not that easy. So look, I want to make it clear that I'm certainly not defending labels or everything in their deals. I'm not even going down that path. I'm just giving you the background of the dynamics that drive deals. And you've got to remember, as cruel as it sounds, that when you take somebody else's money for anything, you're nuts if you don't know that you give away a degree of independence. And as Morrissey said, no one made you sign it. So you've got to go in with your eyes, your eyes wide open. Because no one company or model can be all things to all people. You've got to embrace and implore the opportunities that all the choice that's out there now provides. And you've got to seriously think about what really works for you because it's fine to dream, but you do need to wake up in the morning. And getting a digital release is breathtakingly simple compared to years ago. And it may feel cool and it might be all you desire, which is absolutely fine, but it doesn't equate to achieving what real success, which is what a lot of people are after. Success is really different to release and it's very, very tough to achieve. So effectively, you can look at labels and write them off as a bunch of self-serving pricks and not being for you, and I totally understand that. But if you want to do it on your own, you've got to take the time to understand and plan everything necessary to take their place. You've got to buy in some expertise if it's needed. The shrinkage in labels means there are a lot of really good people out there contracting their services. And, and working with music is detailed, complex, and a lot of work. There are no shortcuts. People aspire to, I just, they want the end result without realising that end result, that, that famous line when people say you're an overnight sensation and they say to you privately, yeah, I'm a 10 year overnight sensation, thanks. Um, so if you do take the leap and sign a deal, it's, it's, it's pointless to treat your label with disdain and everybody like the enemy, because if you feel that way, don't do the deal, it's guaranteed to end in tears. So get close to the staff, be reasonable and be proactive and articulate your goals. But don't just dump responsibility for your future on others. You've got to engage, but stick to your guns when artistic integrity really matters. That's important. But for God's sake, be flexible if it doesn't. Never be petty and remember that nobody knows it all. So you've got to remain aware of the business realities lurking behind your deal because that's looming over your colleagues' heads and sometimes more than you realise, even yours. So in the end, it's no secret that opportunities really do abound. Um, it's not good guys versus bad guys. It's really people working with people. And people work better for people they genuinely like and respect. Thank you. No questions? Hi. Over here. Um, hello. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, that was a really great talk. Um, I just wanted to ask, I don't know if this is the right forum for it, because I know it's all to do with sort of independent artists and all that sort of thing. But um, where do musicians fit into the picture in terms of like the working musicians? Because you've had a lot of experience, obviously, with labels. Um, what's the perception there in terms of the actual working musicians who come in, do the recordings, do the touring, all that sort of thing? Where do they fit in? You know, workers' rights, pay scale, all that sort of thing. You know, royalties. Like, well, uh, the, well, the pay scale is sort of. Is, I think there are well, there's two, three things, I suppose. There's the agreement you can have just directly with the. Are you talking about working for an artist who's already signed a deal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, it depends on the deal you cut with the artist, I suppose. So, in a, in a recording budget, if there's a whole range of musicians, then th that's costed out. Whatever deal you do with them, I think there are union pay scales and award rates. Well, yeah, that's that's what I was tr sort of right. trying to get to, like, um, in terms I, I, don't, I don't know what they are. I, yeah, uh, okay. But, uh, so, I mean, effectively, that's worked out between either the, the artist the artist manager yeah. before it gets to the label or the A&R department will be working on that as part of the budget. Yeah. Um, and if there's royalties involved, well, that would be cut 
with the artist normally rather than with the record label. So yep. we would, the record label would pay the artist X percent and then if they've decided to give some away to other people, that's their call. Yeah, I was, I was sort of asking, the, the answer I'm sort of trying to get to is um, because you've been in the industry in various positions and all that sort of thing, like what's the reference that you guys use for how much the musicians are worth? Um, um, because the union doesn't really exist anymore, and right. there is a live performance award um, for musicians. But you know, basically, what I'm trying to get at is that musicians are sort of treated as plebs. And yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sidestepping. So I, I actually don't know, and it really, it's, when the artists are creating the album, I mean, I don't. Kathy, Kathy's still here. I mean, with it, are you better able to answer that? Um, so it's really the manager that deals with the musicians or the artist directly, and it is just what's negotiated. So I guess what you're asking is there sort of a fair system going on and probably not yeah i i understand that i'm, I'm in the yeah. industry yeah, on that level yeah but, but adrian um, only deals really with the artist directly yeah and i then understand it's that the too, artist and manager that then deal with the musicians so his area doesn't but if if the label is paying all the bills essentially and, and hiring the musicians on behalf of the artists whether it's they've got their own managers and all that like who is um i guess the person in charge of of doing that and, and well, costing the way, it out. The is way it the marketing that we people? Operated is, Sorry? The way that we operated is the label gave us money and then it was our role. So it's it's rare that the a and it's, it, it, sometimes it's the A&R person, but the artist and manager still have to approve all of that. So it really comes back down to the artist and manager. Artist manager. Okay. That, they're the decision makers in what the musicians and, get paid. And what do they reference for that as a standard? It's really what they, there is no reference as in what, what you normally pay someone. Like there's kind of, you kind of get a feel for sort of a really high level or someone who maybe doesn't do it as a normal job. But also usually the, the musician just says, this is what I charge. So it's, it's there's no, the yeah. The top section players would charge a very high fee for a three hour call. Yep. The top players. Mm -hmm. So they would charge a lot and then you've got, you've got different scales. You know, someone yeah. might charge a hundred bucks for a three hour call in the studio to lay down some tracks. Mm -hmm. But the top session players might charge a thousand bucks. Because uh, they're not going to ever see a royalty. They yep. won't see a royalty through PPCA, they won't see a royalty through APRA. So yeah. it's the market rate depending on their skill, like any other job. Mm. The higher skilled they are, the better paid they are. Yep. Done. Thanks.